so we shall now commence this uh, ceremony. Now, I've been asked not to take more than four minutes, which for a Tunisian um, by birth is uh, almost impossible, but I'll do my level best to take account of that imperative. Madam Director General of UNESCO, Ms. Audrey uh, President Francois Hollande, whom I can't see, I think I'd recognize him, Prime Minister Bernard Cazeneuve, Madam Mayor of Paris, Ms. Anne Hidalgo, President of the French National Commission to UNESCO, Mr. Yves Saint-Jour, Secretary General of the French National Commission to UNESCO, Mr. Alexandre Navarro, ladies and gentlemen ambassadors, your excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, well, first of all, a few words of thanks, which will be addressed to the French National Commission to UNESCO and to the Edgar Morin Foundation, and especially to Ms. Saba uh, Abloussam uh, Morin for the preparation and organization of this ceremony. And I also thank her for the um, boldness she's displayed in suggesting that I be the moderator for this ceremony, uh, when I'm known uh, as someone who is undisciplined. But thank you for your trust. Our thanks also go to UNESCO and to its Director General, Madam Audrey Azoulay, for their welcome and also the Minister of Europe and Foreign Ministers uh, for the support given uh, to this event. Now, as far as Edgar Morin is concerned, I am duty-bound to say some words about this great thinker. I had prepared a text uh, stemming from a discussion we had some time ago about the humanities and the championing of humanities, but I was told that the text is too long, so I'll keep it in um, a store for his 120, 120th birthday. So uh, Edgar Morin for me uh, symbolizes four uh, aspects, the thinker, the, uh, the dreamer, the decipherer, and uh, a joyous humanist. And I wish to refer to four slightly modified aphorisms from a great thinkers representing those four fundamental aspects of the personality and work of Edgar Morin. The first aphorism is that when it's uh, bright daylight, uh, scientists check their theories and their evidence and turn over each stone in their quest for rigor. But when night falls and when the full moon is uh, glowing, he or she dreams floating among the stars and uh, being amazed by the marvels of nature. And that is where the inspiration comes from. Without dreaming, there's no art or science or creativity. Edgar Morin is a great dreamer, a great creative dreamer. We um, owe this uh, aphorism to Sir Michael Adger, a great uh, mathematician and um, uh, who's on another planet compared to the modest mathematician that I am. The second modified aphorism. If people think that mathematic, mathematics are difficult, Edgar, then it's simply because they have still not understood the complexity of the world in which they live. And that aphorism is one we owe to John von Neumann, one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, the father of the computer age, um, and so mathematics are a way of deciphering the world and reality. And throughout your work, you have been a wonderful decipherer, decoder of complexity. And the third aphorism, many think that the main aim of science is public utility, uh, the explanation of human behavior and natural phenomena. But the paramount aim of science is above all, and first and foremost, the honor, the honoring of the human mind. And that is another fundament, fundamental aspect of the work and action of Edgar Morin at the service of the honor of the human mind. And this comes from another mathematician from the 19th century, Carl Gustav Jacobi, who uh, was writing to another great mathematician to criticize a third great mathematician, Joseph Fourier, to whom we owe uh, computers, 
uh, MRIs, medical imaging, and so on. So math mathematics are useful in all the fields of science and thought. And the last aphorism, to keep it short, because I think I've reached my time limit, and I owe it to my own teacher, not, not my uh, math teacher, but my martial arts teacher. I've uh, uh, been doing judo and kendo for 40 years, and I'm now a, a black belt, mentally more than physically, in judo, but it was Michimi Sensei, my master, uh, who's a red belt in judo, uh, who would say the, the following. Sad people um, may do it because of uh, their posture, but those are not serious people if they pose as being sad, and you should avoid them. And throughout my life, I have tried to put gaiety and joy and not posed in sadness in, in everything I've done. And I must say that Edgar Morin is a joyful humanist who always has this beautiful smile. And I hope he'll still be wearing it when he's 120 years old. And I hope we'll all be back to celebrate his birthday, his 120th birthday in 20 years time. Thank you. And now I have the honor of inviting the Director General, Ms. Andre, uh, Audrey Adulai, to say a few words. Monsieur le Prime Minister, my dear friend Bernard Cazeneuve, Madam Mayor of Paris, my dear friend Anne Hidalgo, President of the French National Commission to UNESCO, my dear friend Yves Saint Jour, and uh, dear Georges Haddad, and my very dear friend Edgar Morin. I'm very happy, Edgar, that you chose UNESCO and you wanted to see UNESCO in order to begin this uh, wonderful fairy tale of uh, images which we are witnessing today. You chose the House of UNESCO, which is the House of the United Nations the House of Multilateralism, the House of Education, of Science uh, in all its dimensions, culture, the freedom of expression. And I know that we would need several days, not just the ones which we've scheduled and many nights to attempt to bring together all the facets of your life and your work, and we still wouldn't achieve it. So I will not engage in that exercise, but I would like to say before the friends that we've managed to get together here and all of those who are watching us, and there are many more of them online, I'd like to say uh, that you are at home here in UNESCO where we are celebrating this great intellectual and faithful friend who has always pointed the way. Your work and your thinking have always uh, fitted uh, within the uh, values of the United Nations, defense of human dignity, uh, joyful curiosity about others, the defense of nature and justice, and freedom. In a nutshell, everything that brings us together and makes us humanity. And that's for you, you who saw UNESCO born, uh, a source of inspiration, a guiding light, and a friend. This companionship has developed over the years in the columns of our philosophical magazine, the UNESCO Courier, first of all, where one can follow the train of your thought ever since your first article in 1993, when you were already analyzing for us the crisis of the future alongside other great writers such as Andre Brink and Joseph Kiyazabo, and you were already calling for people to grasp and get others to grasp our common destiny in 1995. In the Courier again of UNESCO, you set forth this groundbreaking uh, concept, as we can see how groundbreaking it was, the concept of Earth as a fatherland. And we can also think about your intervention in 2004, again in the Courier of UNESCO, when people were uh, talking about a clash of civilizations. You reminded us that true 
The true dialogue is one one acknowledges in others the same dignity as in oneself. And at the turn of the century, you uh, responded to an explicit, urgent request from the, this organization to contribute to our reflection on education, publishing the seven complex lessons in education for the future. And at the same time, at the turn of the century, in Mexico, uh, at the time of the inauguration of the first a roving UNESCO University chair in Mexico on complex thought at the uh, Salvador University, but also in Argentina and in, in Buenos Aires. And I'd like to uh, hail here Professor Raul Domingo Mota, who is in charge of the chair, who left us sadly in February. And you need to gauge the impact of your work now in Latin America and in the Caribbean, where you are a true star, as I saw for myself. And ever since then, you've continued to uh, have your voice heard in UNESCO and to pave the way, whether it's here at the Global Congress, the World Congress for uh, on complex thought held in 2016, or more recently, the World Philosophy Day in UNESCO dealing with uh, issues related to the pandemic. And of course, the work which you are doing today at the UNESCO University Chair on Complexity, which was set up in 2019 in Montpellier. I would especially at this stage like to greet Saba, your, your wife, who uh, has stood by you throughout your life and through your work, and who worked in the French National Commission for UNESCO to promote that, this conference. And this uh, multiple, um, uh, historic companionship between Edgar Morin and UNESCO lies on a number of common foundations. Your lucidity about the need to preserve our Earth, and this is what we're doing with our work on the biosphere, uh, the Asians, uh, natural heritage sites, and indigenous cultures. And also, you very quickly alerted us to the issue of the ethical challenges of the technological revolution. And in your work on fraternity, you warned about this huge uh, calculating algorithm-based machine, reducing human life to its techno-economic dimension, reducing human beings to an object of calculation. And this is what inspired us in UNESCO and prompted our member states to work on a global instrument on the ethics of artificial intelligence, and marked by and led by your thinking which we may adopt in November in this very same room. And lastly, the strong faith in the power of education when it's given the, the wherewithal to meet the, the challenges of the world. And uh, your work on um, the seven uh, sources of knowledge is a fundamental benchmark here. And uh, we also need to think about the importance of the critical view of education given this unleashing online of false rumours and conspiracy theories. And you've always said that we should pit knowledge against it, again, or, or fields of knowledge against themselves to speak to each other, not shut them off with uh, uh, a moving away from a cloistering of traditional knowledge, uh, which uh, is the hallmark of many specialists, but you've uh, avoided. And I think the UNESCO Founding Fathers understood this in the art aftermath of the moral and ethical disaster of the Second World War, giving this organization a wide-ranging mandate, spanishing human, natural uh, sciences, education, culture, information, the, this uh, mingling of fields which uh, uh, bring about multidisciplinarity. So thank you for this companionship. Thank you for being this guiding light. Thank you for being with us today. And I wish to say uh, how much uh, the youth of your expression inspires us, and uh, I'm particularly personally struck every time I've had the good fortune to discuss things with you. I've always been struck by the fact that having gone through this odyssey in history, you have continued with great elegance to smile and highlight the importance of um, happiness and friendship, and I think that's something we must all take inspiration from. Thank you. Merci, Madame la Directrice Générale. Thank you, Director General, for that moving tribute paid to Edgar Morin. It's now a pleasure for me to give the floor to Her Excellency, Madame Anne Hidalgo, the Mayor of Paris.
Monsieur le Prime Minister, my dear friend Bernard Cazeneuve, Madam Director General, um, my dear friend Audrey Azoulay, ladies and gentlemen, and my dear friend Edgar Morin and dear Sabah, dear friends, it is a source of great joy to be with you all this evening to celebrate um, no ordinary birthday, that of a centurion, of uh, no uh, ordinary man, Edgar Morin. And I would like to express my warmest thanks to UNESCO and to Audrey Azoulay for organising this day devoted to the work of Edgar Morin, to his thought and to his reach across the whole of society in France and abroad. Dear Edgar, you are going to be 100 years old. 100 years, what a sublime age and what good fortune for you and for us alike. And on this birthday, of course, I wish to say thank you to you and also say that your life, like your choices, uh, elicits my, admira my admiration, my profound respect and uh, immense gratitude. You are a child of the 20th century. You have been a fully fledged protagonist of that century in which uh, human beings have been capable of the best and the worst. And if one were to summarize your journey, we could say that you've always had this amazing and calm lucidity in placing your life on the right side of destiny, on the side of humanism, of compassion and of resistance. This irrepressible need to resist dates back to your earliest years when you came face to face with the horror of fascism as a young teenager you decided to fight preparing packages to assist the republican fighters in spain a history which as you know has a special resonance in me and which really matters to me and then as a student in toulouse you became friends with many left-wing intellectuals such as vladimir jankilievich before entering the resistance, joining the resistance, in 1942. You were a close friend of Marguerite Duras, François Mitterrand, Robert, Robert Antelm. You belonged to the Rue, Rue Saint-Benoît group of intellectuals that took their name from um, Marguerite's home street. And at the end of the war, you were to be present at an event which would leave its mark on you forever, the liberation of Paris, this city, which you loved so much and which uh, then came back to life and exploded with joy. And we've often talked about this. You are a witness, an eyewitness of the arrival of the, the Nueve Capitaine Drones uh, division in General Leclerc's army. And you are one of those eyewitness witnesses who saw these liberators speaking Spanish when everybody was expecting to see the Americans. You told me all about it. And it's always amused me a great deal because we meet regularly and we do so now uh, today to um, celebrate the arrival of the liberating soldiers. And you often talk about it with real feeling and passion as if to gently instruct us that we should never forget the taste of rediscovered freedom throughout this century of resisted and this fierce resolve to champion causes which you felt were just was never to leave you. For the meaning of life for you was never one of satisfying one's, one's selfish demands, but on the contrary, to exist within a community of destinies bound to each other, curious about each other and dependent on each other. You drew this defining humanism from your experience, but also from your reading. You love to quote Montaigne in describing this philosophy that is so close to your own. Every man is my compatriot. And in your book on the lessons of a century of life, you wrote, who am I? And I reply, I am a human being. Yes, my dear friend Edgar Morin, you are first and foremost a humanist. And this universalism, according to which all human beings are equal, 
and bound by their condition is something you also found in the writings of Dostoevsky, whose books overwhelmed you. You uh, love his, the attention he pays to the humiliated, the offended, and those left by the wayside, uh, the invisible, as we would call them today. And I'm thinking of this appeal in uh, the Brothers Karamazov. Above all, I say to you, take your pride down a notch. And that is a, an appeal which uh, resembles you. And we could have read it in your own maxims. You who throughout your life exalted modesty, humility and kindness. As a hero of the resistance, a sociologist, an anthropologist, you are a great theoretician of knowledge as well. And here too, in the field of knowledge, you are a, a resistor. You resist by championing this com complex thought and your fierce opposition to the war in Algeria in 1955, your commitment in the vanguard again of the defense of the environment. You are one of the uh, trailblazers in defending the environment back in the 1970s when you warned of the pernicious consequences of the separation between human beings and animals, an issue which we are rediscovering today with all its acuteness and relevance, um, and also the issue of secularism. You've always championed true and authentic complex thought. You are inspiring, Edgar, uh, faced with certain people who would like to reduce um, us all to simplistic binary mannequin thinking. And those voices are particularly powerful today. You instead propose that we tie knowledge together, teach transdisciplinarity and cherish our independence and our uncertainty alike. As you often say, living means uh, coping with the unexpected. It means chance and grappling with chance. And in these disorienting times, you offer beacons, but also a method to borrow the name of your great work of that name, uh, spanning six volumes between 1977 and 2006. And this method means accepting that you don't have all the answers, but also managing to ask the right questions and highlighting our contradictions and our inconsistencies. Your thought is needed now more than ever if we are to rise to the challenges of our time, given the climate emergency and the preservation, the need to pre preserve our common good. Good, You are a think of our planetary age and a wonderful compass. Dear Edgar, at 100 years of age, your curiosity is intact, as is your talent for transmitting your thinking to others, and it is in preparing our minds to tackle the most important problems of our time. Uh, it is in this vein that you wish to set up the Edgar Morin Foundation, which I'm delighted and proud to host in the Climate Academy in Paris, the Patrick Cloche uh, Foundation, which will open its doors in September and which will inspire the young generations in this place of knowledge, young Parisian uh, women and men uh, and people from the Paris region, inspired by your thinking, will learn to work in, in a group to navigate between uncertainty and error and acquire knowledge which may be useful in, as you so often say, in building new hope, this hope which we can read in your playful expression and in your luminous smile. For your generosity, for your battles, for everything, I wish to say thank you. Bien. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Madam Mayor of Paris. And before giving the floor to our master, I saw Marie-Hélène Masque, the uh, education minister, but behind the mask, um, Jean-Michel Blanquer, uh, who's got a much nicer mask than I have, and I recognized you. I also wish a bit of a warm welcome to you, Minister of Education, uh, Mr. Blanquer. Edgar, you have the floor. Merci, vraiment. Avec beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'm very moved. Audrey Azoulay and Hildalgo, my friend from the French UNESCO Committee, for all their work. 
which has been remarkable and has allowed this meeting to be prepared. Let me thank Saba, my wife, who was the ant working tirelessly away like in the fable to bring together all these different elements so that this day could happen. And then all my friends, old and no, known and unknown, who are present here in this room. I wanted to make a little presentation under the heading of Frank Sinatra's song, My Way. But I'm also going to put it under the heading of Antonio Machado, who said, you cannot, you, you create your path as you walk along it. I have made my path as I've walked along it. I didn't follow a path that had already been laid out. I'm not going to tell you my whole life story. I'm just going to talk about this intellectual path I have walked along and which has meant my way of thinking has never stopped building itself because it's never finished. And still today, when I'm no longer here, it will still not be finished. So I can start in 1939, perhaps, when I started university, and that was also the year, a few months later, that France and England declared war on Germany. So that was what we called the Droll de Guerre, the phony war. And I signed up for a philosophy which included psychology and sociology at that time. I registered in history as well, something that I'll never forget. And also at the law school, because that's where political science was taught. I wasn't so interested in the rest, although I did find in the history of Roman law there were some very interesting things to think about. I also registered at the École de Sciences Politiques, the School for Political Science. So, if you will, I was already dealing with many different, different disciplines, at least in the field of human sciences. I wanted to be transdisciplinary, interdisciplinary. Why was that? Because in the years before the war that I had lived through as a teenager, they were very troubled in tormented years, Hitler came to power. The really terrible side of Nazism was visible, but the equally horrible side of the Moscow trials as well, the Spanish Civil War, when we also saw a crisis of democracy and a crisis of capitalism, we said to ourselves, I recognize without knowing it Kant's phrase, what can I know, what can I believe, what can I hope? And this inevitable question at that troubled time, when we were dealing with choices and alternatives that were equally monstrous, except for a very small group that was looking for a third way, Simon Weil and some others. So I said, let me think about this. To answer these questions, we need to know what people are and what human history is, exactly what Kant was saying to, to answer these questions. Because human history seemed to me to lead us to incredible depths of madness. And therefore, I already became a humanologist without knowing that's what I was doing. That is to say, bringing together and connecting different things. Because at that time, a great friend of mine who was also a student, just as I was, who had been a student of a Marxist professor said, do you know, Marxist thought doesn't really work, but to understand history and to understand people 
You have to follow the same path he did, because he wanted to know what the world was, what life was, what societies are and what the oldest human societies were, what, what's history, what are people, what's the future, what's economic development. And so Marx, with this example, and I'd read some of his books, said, well, okay, I said, I'm going to try to understand what human beings are. And so I tried to study those things. And I thought that I had considerable literary culture, not just Raman's, but Montaigne, Montesquieu, Voltaire, other great authors like that. But I enriched that with historical culture, human sciences, sociology, psychology, other fields. So from the very outset, I didn't have a path set out before me. There was rather a horizon that I wanted to walk towards. And, well, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but what is interesting to note is that even before the end of the war, I joined the headquarters of the First Army, led by General Delatre, and I was in occupied Germany. And here I asked myself, well, how is it possible that the people, the nation that were the most cultivated in all of Europe became the most barbaric of all. And I also saw a Germany totally in ruins. And I said, I have to try to understand what happened, what's going on in these people's heads who believed in Hitler and who don't believe in anything any longer because everything that I could study led me to believe they didn't believe at all in what the Allies said. So I wrote my first book, which was based on things I was wondering myself about a very complex phenomenon. That is to say, that cultivated country which had become such a barbaric country. And the next phase was perhaps the decisive one. In 1948, 1949, I began my work at Vendette, and I was not yet working at the research center, the CNRS. I was, in fact, unemployed. But the misfortune of being unemployed was, in fact, a blessing because it meant I could work for two years at the National Library. I do my work, I mean, and uh, my wife was teaching in a high school in the provinces and was earning enough money to keep our household running and to support our children while I pursued my studies. And so this subject, man and death, led me to consider all forms of belief on death, the hereafter, and I saw that in all societies, starting with the oldest societies, even with before societies, with Neanderthals, there is a consciousness that there is death, which is irredimable decomposition of the flesh. But at the same time, people believe that this decomposition will be surmounted by something else that will go on living, or to be reborn in another way as we see in various forms of Buddhist tradition and others. So if you like belief in the universe, uh, life after death was there. And studying all these mythologies of death for me was a first important element in what I consider to be Marx's heritage. I realized that the world of the imagination, myth, belief, religion, are not superstructures of a secondary nature as against the economic and material mass. Rather, they are just as real 
and the dialectic, it's, which was based on matter and economics, is a wheel which turns through the economy, the mind, the imagination. So that was, if you like, one of the first elements that was very important. And during this research, I was struck by a paradox, not just a paradox that human beings entirely aware that death is an irreversible decomposition of the body and have this very realistic idea supplanted by mythological consciousness. And then I had another paradox in mind as well. At the same time as they were horrified by death, people for their own families, for their children, for their country, for their party or for their religion, are capable to say, right, I'm going to die. And so that already showed, I think, human complexity, some elements of that complexity. And so this first book was not just important from that viewpoint, but it also brought together material on knowledge that was dispersed over totally compartmentalized disciplines. And to bring these together, they had to be organized in some way. And it was that work of organizing which brought me up against paradoxes, like the ones I just described. So without having this word, but it was already complexity. Bringing things together, seeing different aspects of people's problems, dealing with death. And that led me also to make my first incursion into biology, because, of course, people are mortal beings. And because they're alive, uh, at that time I said, right, I need to study death at least a bit to see if it's pre-planned, can it be postponed by science, and so on and so forth. I can't develop all of this right now for you, but that was also a very important step or phase. And the year of the publication of that book was the year I joined the CNRS, which gave me the chance to make a free career. I was left to be free. And with a salary and minimal guaranteed conditions that allowed me to live my life perhaps not being very strictly supervised, although they put me in sociology. I drifted a bit, and still in my interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way, because at the beginning I created a subject for myself, which was cinema. And cinema, of course, was a subject which fascinated me, not just because I love the cinema, but also because there's this wonderful thing where the play of light and shadow and color on a screen give you, give us a deep reality. Imaginary things seem real. And having experienced the exploits, the happy and sad parts of the lives of the people with whom we identify because we love them, everything being in that reality, we nonetheless remain aware that we're at the cinema. So we have a parallel consciousness. We have a feeling of reality on the screen, but at the same time, we haven't left our seats. And so, this is a situation which is very interesting. It, people, who, intellectuals who despised the cinema were wrong to say this isn't an interesting phenomenon. It interested me greatly. And just with novels, but with images that are much more present and concrete, we discovered reality. It's a school to discover the world, and it certainly was for me something very important indeed. And so, 
instead of dealing with the sociology of the cinema. Much more than that, I wanted to talk about the cinema in a book about sociology, where I would talk about media culture and the, something that was translated from American English that we called low culture. And here again, I came up against something very concrete, studying a couple of books. And we looked at a product, which were serial films in this case. We saw that there were some which were very banal indeed, and there were some masterpieces. How is it possible for this machine, which is following an industrial model with specialization of labor with actors, scriptwriters, decorators, musicians, and so on, and which is working for profit, for money. How is it possible that this machine, which is practically an industrial one, can produce at the same time masterpieces, which can be magnificent, like John Ford's films? So I arrived at that point, and that was already a complex subject because it was contradictory, which is that films are the result of a antagonistic collaboration between production and creation. That there is a struggle, and then finally more or less a compromise or an agreement between the creator, who is making the art of cinema, and the producer, who is doing the business of the cinema. And so I saw this paradox as well in song and in other areas as well, and instead of having a simplifying vision of something which was unrefined and for the people. Uh, so again, today with TV series, we saw that they also can be works of art. And so, if you will, I got into this and we had ideas which seemed to be more and more contradictory together. And so, let me continue on this train of thought. I'll go very rapidly over sociological studies which fascinate me because I still wonder what's happening in life with a method that isn't a standard method, but which I invent myself on the basis of what I'm studying, like the famous Orleans rumor, which was big episode in French life, and I continued my intellectual training because in the 1950s, 1956 in particular, together with uh, some friends, I created a publication which we called Arguments, and here I tried to bring on board thinkers who I thought were important from the Frankfurt School, Adorno, Wagner. I was already familiar with Marcuse, and I was the one who translated him into French, one of his major works in any case. There was also the second Heidegger. I was only familiar with the first. And through this publication, which was just a group of friends who were discussing and debating things, putting it together, I went on building my own culture and my way of thinking. And in particular, you need to think that those years, the 1950s, were incredible years. Why is that? Because during those years, first of all, Stalin died. Secondly, a few years later, the denunciation of Stalin as a criminal by Khrushchev's report. There was the Hungarian Revolution, Polish October, the whole Soviet system, which was badly shaken, the whole Stalinist system was called into question. And at the same time, there was the Franco-British expedition to Suez and the war on Egypt. At the same time again, or almost, the Putsch in Algiers, where the generals ended up calling on de Gaulle. And so 
what had seemed to be a permanent, ongoing, indestructible thing, which was the Fourth Republic, collapsed totally. The myth collapsed, and we had a time of intense questioning, which we undertook, and at that time as well, I saw that there were great gaps in Marxist thinking. His consumption of man, for instance, as something entirely productive with no emotions, not the person who Freud talked about, and with, with no playful side, a very, very reductive vision of people, and therefore of history. I realized, not Freud, but Marx, rather, had a conception of physical reality which was unilateral, matter, whereas physical science was already showing that energy and matter flow into one another. And biology showed us that formation also played a vital role in the world of living things. So if you like, this is a time where after argument, with Claude Lefort and the Cornelius Castiorades, they, we, but really they, brought together a circle where people thought about things, where people expressed their own thoughts above and beyond Marxist thought, which was very, very remarkable in both of these men. And they were really my two traveling companions at that time. And I also participated in what we called the Group of Ten, where we had people from medicine, from biology, from decision-making fields, where we tried to inculcate one another with our ways of thinking. And that's where I discovered that cybernetics was not this automatic, mechanic thing which I had imagined, but something more subtle and complex, because we saw that cybernetics is what allows us to introduce this extraordinary notion of a loop, of feedback, which can be proactive or rectoactive, and which destroys the irreducible nature of the notion of cause and the notion of effect and their relation. You have a thermostat. Once you get to a certain temperature, the thermostat shuts the machine off. And so the effect becomes a cause. And in this feedback system, in this loop, what happens? Autonomy, thermal autonomy in this case. Let us say the room is warm, whereas it's cold outside. And this problem of dependence of autonomy on sources of external energy is something that I discovered again a bit later when in California I came up uh, many people's works that already existed on this subject because Forster for instance already had said and defined self-organization. This is a notion which biologists only managed quite late on, taking very small steps to get to. But we have these systems which self-organize, which consume energy and breathe. They're hard to beat, and therefore people need to have some outside energy source. Any form of autonomy is dependent, and those two opposed ideas have to be linked. And so complexity progressed through all of these things, all the more so since this word, its definition, came from Azubi. Azubi who said, complexity is measuring the degree of variety of a system which is to say something which is one and multiple at the same time, a system made up of different elements. And why is it complex? Here again, 
in this extraordinary notion of emergence, which itself is beginning to be a bit more widely used, but which is of capital importance here because, first of all, we have to realize that everything we call objects and systems, molecules, atoms, this table, ourselves, so then secondly, a system made up of different elements, different from one another, uh, made up of different molecules, for instance, including bacteria. And such a system, in its own organization, will produce qualities which do not exist in consecutive elements. And it's constituent, sorry. And therefore, a living being produces qualities. It can recharge itself with energy. It can have cognitive knowledge of its environment, of its own organization, can repair itself, can reproduce itself. These are qualities which molecules that make it up absolutely do not have. And so you see that going along this path, particularly thanks to the discoveries I was making of these thinkers themselves who weren't very well known because they were mathematicians or engineers, and given the great compartmentalization of sciences, we were unaware of them in human sciences and in natural sciences. So this was but by taking all of these different contributions of very different natures on board that I got the idea of doing this work, which we called the method. But before that, I also had another important phase or step, which was a Congress on Unity of Man, which I co-organized with Jacques Monod and others, and it was all the more important for me because I was able to report on my book, The Paradigm and Human Nature. And what was the problem here, once again? This was in 1972, more or less. And since the 1960s, first of all, prehistory had changed because we had discovered that there were hominids that were much, much further back in time that we thought, and that people didn't suddenly erupt in evolution, but that there had been a long process. And now we have many millions of years, we have to explain it this way. Then secondly, we discovered that chimpanzees can speak. Not glottally, but they can uh, use the language of the deaf mute. And someone came to this workshop and explained that. There were other elements and experiences change. So this enormous chasm which seemed to exist between the animal world and particularly the world of, of monkeys and chimpanzees and the world of human beings were in fact much closer together than we thought. Not simply because of chromosomes, but because of many traits and characteristics that we had discovered. And so that doesn't take anything away from human originality because complexity isn't reductive. It tries rather to show that I'm quickly getting to this conclusion about in my book called The Lost Paradigm, that human beings can only have a trinitary definition, an individual, a species, and a society. But these three elements just as in the Holy Trinity, are inseparable. They're not juxtaposed. Why is that? First of all, the species is the product of individuals, but individuals who are the product of a system of reproduction themselves reproduce their reproductive system. So we are both products and producers interactions between human beings produce societies which, as they emerge, with language and culture which retroact on human beings. Human beings produce societies and societies 
produce human beings. Individuals themselves are both within society and society with its culture are within individuals. Individuals are within the species, but the species with their DNA present in all of their cells are present, is present within the individual. And so here we start to see what complexity is, because we're not simply talking about retroactivity, but rather a loop in which products produce themselves. And so here, that's how I started having this thought. And I worked on the method for about 30 years, and it's an exploration to revise really our whole mode of knowledge that we have, which is just based on binary thinking, on reduction, on compartmentalization, so as to become much more relevant. And so this work, which I wanted to do, I also wanted to make known because it wasn't at that time very well known. But now, now there's cognitive science, but even cognitive science is somewhat broken up, somewhat compartmentalized. And what's, I think, interesting here is that all knowledge being a sort of translation and reconstruction, for instance, visually, on the basis of photons which come to our retinas. So any form of knowledge bears the risk of error because all translations and all reconstructions may do this, beginning with our own perceptions, our ideas, our theories, and so forth. And so that, if you will, is the general structure of what I'm trying to do. This path I have been going down to try now to have the capacity to see what complex knowledge can be. Knowledge, sometimes when it is complex, has not just the whole inside the part, but the part inside the whole. Not just complementary elements, but also antagonistic elements, and so on and so forth. And then secondly, complex thought is organized. And that has led me further to think about science, about education, about politics, and so on. And for instance, in my book on science, I use books which scientists often don't read and which are very important works, uh, Bachelard, Le Père, Kuhn, Michelson, Alton, and others. People who have thought about science and unfortunately, science doesn't think about itself. It only sees objects. And as I said very clearly on a crisis in European science, it said scientists are blind to themselves and to their subjects, not just personal and human subjects, but the adventure of science, which escapes any form of rational control presently especially since the discovery of atomic energy and of genetics. And so we're creating a way of proceeding, a way of dealing with knowledge, which I've tried to transpose onto education with books like The Seven Forms of Knowledge that UNESCO was kind enough to publish in 2000, and others as well on politics with my book called My Way. <laughs> and my path, if you will. And um, we see this in also Le Monde, a newspaper, which for a long time gave me great freedom to carry out certain diagnoses on our times. 
And so, if you'll allow me, and if I'm not taking too much of your time, I will try very quickly to conclude. Saying that one of the characters that has most greatly struck me about the time we're living through. It's hard to cut periods into neat little slices, but I have one specific that I began with in 1945. Why is that? Because that's when humanity created the weapon which potentially could destroy itself. So it's led to a permanent sword of Damocles, or several different swords as these weapons are multiplying, but there is this phantom lurking over our future. So that was 1945. And then in 1972, there was something else, a different sort of catastrophe. It was the Midas report that showed that there was irreversible degradation of our biosphere underway, and we ourselves as inhabitants of that biosphere who breathe polluted air with an industrial culture that pollutes our soil, rivers and oceans are polluted, and so degradation of the earth also threatens the life of our civilizations, our societies, and of our, our persons. And then a second major threat which emerged at that time, paradoxically, toward 1980, transhumanism took off, starting in Silicon Valley in California where you had people who were both illuminated speakers, but at the same time, thinkers, but at the same time, very concrete. Today, it's true that knowledge of stem cells with prostheses and many other possibilities, including genetic mutation, mean that we could prolong human life, possibly, indefinitely. And of course, this possibility became an incredible myth with belief in immortality, as if we could destroy bacteria and viruses, which also happen to be indispensable for our lives, beginning with those in our intestines, and as if we could eliminate all the different accidents which might occur or eliminate the death of the sun and many other things. So there was this form of madness, this myth, <coughs> on the basis of a scientific reality or possibility. Artificial intelligence, which will also develop further, is becoming an element of this mythology. They're the one, it's the one that's going to deal with everything in the service of an augmented or greater man. That's the idea. We're going to augment everything, life, power. So it's true that these same forms of progress, biological, technical, scientific, these same forms of progress would, on the contrary, allow us to free human beings from the most tiring or bothersome tasks and allow them to have a life which is given over to improving human relations and to culture. So we have the possibilities not only of augmented human beings, but of better or improved human beings. So you have at the same time as these deadly threats, promises one of, of power, which is actually a bit terrifying for me, and another, of course, which would be excellent, but and then on top of all of this, globalization, 
the fact that starting at a time when the market economy and capitalism are everywhere in the USSR and China and there are immediate means of communication which are universal as well, we have true globalization. And globalization is happening technically and economically. It's absolutely not happening in terms of mentalities. Instead of creating an idea of common human destiny with the nuclear threat, environmental threat, or even because of this invasion or domination of profit in our whole world, on the contrary, there is a retraction of cultures that are turning inward. And with something that I've seen in other periods of crisis, in 1929-1930, when I was a teenager, for instance, all of these trends that were nationalist, that were about closing off fear of foreigners, anti-Semitism, nasty slogans about people with different skin colors. Today, there are other scapegoats and other imaginary enemies, but instead of being aware of the external community, people are turning inward. And so <coughs> we now find ourselves in this curious situation where we're becoming aware that interactions <coughs> and technical and economic interdependencies have not created any solidarity at all. We saw that with this virus from the very outset where each culture closed itself off and discovered often that it didn't have enough pharmaceutical or health resources or even the ability to make masks to fight against the virus. So, given globalization and given that already in 1920 we had a pandemic which created a multidimensional crisis which meant that each individual and their destiny in terms of life and death and the people closest to them, because lockdowns also create relationships which could be conflictual or which could, on the contrary, be harmonious, work. The extroverted life that becomes an introverted one so individuals and nations at the same time, and then globalization, our whole planet, all of this creates an enormous problem, a gigantic crisis, which is not over, <coughs> and which continuously creates new forms of uncertainty, and the virus, which seems crazy itself, is creating Mutants, as some people call them. And some people think that it's recombining with other viruses, as if the viruses had some sort of holy alliance against the human race. So here we are in this crisis with all of its uncertainties, its possibilities, that there could be a great leap forward, a possibility to change our path, but there's also the possibility that people regress, that people go back in time, that there be a crisis in democracy with neo-authoritarian states, and even with systems that are so sophisticated that China, for instance, is beginning to use, where there's not just the party, which has created an elite, there's also all of these possibilities for surveillance, facial recognition, drone surveillance, surveillance of phone communications, of email, and so forth. A surveillance society, a society of submission that we could consider to be neo-totalitarianism, which is very different from that which we had in the previous century. So we're going to see all of these different phenomena that they'll continue. And so the future, and here I will conclude, it remains an enigma. 
because at the same time, you have the biological catastrophe as a, as a process where we can at least try to moderate this recursive loop in some way, the nuclear process, our conflict is going to go on being present and multiply, will these not in some way make nuclear wars easier? So you have that process. You also have the process of transhumanism, which itself is based on caste issues, caste in an economic and political sense, and which means that we'll have a very worrying form of society because it will organize everything and destroy any form of freedom and creativity. Or will we, on the contrary, see these wonderful possibilities that technology offers us to improve our relationships and our lives? It being clearly understood, of course, that the essential thing is to be aware, not to dream of another society, a future society, but rather to know that we are living the human adventure. And that is to say the path that each and every one of us follows flows together into an enormous path, an enormous adventure, which happens over time and which we cannot foresee. And in this adventure, as Heraclitus very aptly said, he is my master in philosophic thinking. He says, Concord and Discord are father and mother of all things. And he saw destruction and conflict as well as association and living beings. He also saw solidarity and association as well as in the human universe, the fighting between Eris and Helemus, and finally the winner was Thanatos. So we are in an uncertain adventure. The four currents that I've talked about will interfere with one another, with interactions and reactions. We can't know what's going to happen, but we can know that these will all develop. And that is why I cannot conclude without, let's not say a prophecy, but a warning. I thank you very much. Thank you.